Hello YouTube, it's Barbara Jean. I have a dream I need to get out there. Um, I'm first going to start with a couple of Bible verses from Exodus. Exodus 13, 21. And the Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud to lead them to lead them the way, and by night in an, a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took, not, he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. That was Exodus 13, 21 through 22. Next verse I want to read is Exodus 14, 1 to 3. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pahiroth, between Migdol and the sea over against Bezel, um, Bezeloth, Bezelphon, before it shall, you shall encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness shall shut them in, hath shut them in. So that was Exodus 14, 1 to 3. At least I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to read it. <coughs> um, so anyway, I had a dream and I felt it was pretty important so I'm gonna put um, I had it a couple of nights ago um, in this dream um, I, I was actually had was sitting in my chair and uh, decided to watch the Ten Commandments which I do quite often as I've said before I think I've seen it a few hundred times literally and it was one of my favorite 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 movies of all time um, Anyway, uh, before even the opening credits started to play, you know, the opening music and opening credits, I fell asleep and I fell into a deep sleep. And uh, so when I woke up, the, the movie was over, so I have no idea how long I was asleep. I had to be asleep at least, two, over at least two hours. Uh, but anyway, it's kind of, be, it, it's not surprising that I had a dream about the Ten Commandments. Oh, over, this is the first time I've ever watch the Ten Commandments, then I had a dream about the Ten Commandments. And so in this dream I had, it was about the Ten Commandments. So basically it was about the exodus of the Hebrew people out of out of Egypt. Um, I and a group of people, a small group of people, were leading the people out of Egypt, as in the Ten Commandments. Um, I, I could see behind me, I looked behind me at one point in this dream while we were leading the people out. Um, I saw this long group of uh, people, stream of people, leaving Egypt. And we were going through this mountainous area. Now in the movie, you don't see this mountainous area that people actually pass through, but Ron Wyatt, who um, back in the 70s and 80s was doing a lot of discoveries, the Lord had allowed him to see a lot of discoveries that were going on, uh, hidden truths that were shown that, that Mount Sinai is not in the Sinai Peninsula, but rather it's over in, each, uh, or over in Arabia, like Paul said it was. The Apostle Paul said that Mount Sinai was in Arabia, and Ron discovered, Ron Wyatt discovered that indeed it was, and he found the pathway that the Hebrew people went through in Sinai to a an area that was um, enclosed on uh, one side. There was a valley that you walked through that was mountainous, and there was a valley, and when you got to on the other side of the valley, there was um, a, a huge, massive beach area. That was where the people encamped before they crossed over the Red Sea to to Arabia on the other side, and uh, basically that's where this location of this dream was. I was walking through this valley with this long stream of people following behind me and several other people, and we we were uh, come we came to a beach area on uh, um, in this dream. And on this beach, there was a um, an old-fashioned looking stone hut. It wasn't very big. It was just a stone hut. Oh, I forgot a point. When we were walking, we were being led and directed by a little puffy cloud. It wasn't very big. It wasn't a big, huge pillar or a pillar of fire. It was just a little, it looked like, I couldn't imagine it was very few, a few feet wider. It wasn't huge. It was just this little tiny puffy cloud that we were following. We were behind it and we were we were following this little puffy cloud through these mountains 
And so when we got to the other to the side of the valley of these mountains, we got on this beach, and there was this little old-fashioned stone hut. hut, And it wasn't very big. And so it was, not everyone was allowed in. There was only a the selected few that were allowed into this hut. And when we got into this hut, it was, it, I guess it was like two rooms or one room. I don't know how big it was. It wasn't very big. There were, there were carpets on the floor, um, and there was one chair sitting uh, on one against one wall it was the, a dark wood carved chair on one side uh, of this hut and so we walked in and I sat on the or I sat on the floor on the left hand side of this chair and the other people these other people that were there was about four of us five of us five of us in this dream me and these other people were they were standing they stood in front of the chair and I stood, I sat on the, um, beside the chair on the left-hand side. And when we did that, this woman came into the room. And she was uh, middle-aged. Um, you could tell that she was a woman of, she was ancient, but she didn't look ancient. But we, I kind of classified her as middle-aged. Um, but we were very, very respectful of her. There was a, a sense of, you know, <laughs> We were very, very in awe. It's like she was the queen. That's what it was like. It was like we were allowed to see who we were following. That's who the, I don't know, get into the interpretation a little bit of right now. The cloud that we were following was the Holy Spirit. And when we went into this, the selected few were allowed into this little hut. It was like that cloud that we were following manifested into this woman. We were following the Holy Spirit, and she manifested for this, this select few people that were allowed into this hut. We went and she went and she sat down on the chair. She was very lovely. There was a really nice presence about her. Uh, she didn't look like my mother in this case. Usually, when I see my mother in my, my dreams, she I usually equate that was the Holy Spirit. But in this case, this woman didn't. Although she had the aura of a mother, or an but she was very important and lovely and but there was a presence of oh wow you know we were in the presence of, of someone wonderful and she came in and she sat down in front of us like I said I felt in my heart that that little puffy cloud that we were following was the Holy Spirit and we were seeing the manifestation of her she allowed us to see herself as she came into this room I know long explanation but anyway, it was just, it was very interesting. So as she was, we were sitting there, I wasn't allowed, to, I didn't, she was talking to us. She was speaking to us and I didn't hear what she said, but what I, the sense I was getting in the dream was that she was saying, thank you. Um, she was very happy. There was, she was very, very pleased with what, where we were in this situation that we had brought the people to this place. Um, into this position she was there was a, an, a sense of accomplishment in the dream and I felt like she was saying thank you and 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 uh, um, um, she was showing her she was telling us how appreciate she appreciated us basically um, good work basically was what she was saying that's what I felt in my heart that this is what the conversation was about and then something happened as I was kneeling beside her uh, on the left hand side of her. She turned and looked at me and she began to sing a song. And um, she didn't turn and look at anybody else while she was singing the song. She began to sing a song and she turned and looked at me, straight at me. And it was <laughs> it was a jazz song and I don't remember what it was because whatever the message was, it was I think the Lord took the memory of because I asked the Lord after I woke up and I couldn't remember the name of the song. I kept saying, What was the name? What was that song? I knew it was a song I was familiar with, and I knew it was a jazz song, and it was also a love song. But it was obviously taken out of my mind because it was put into my subconscious mind. But I wasn't allowed to remember what the song was because I think it maybe it was a private message. But anyway, she turned and she started singing the song at me. And she stared. She didn't waver. Her, her her eyes didn't waver. She didn't look around. She just stared right at me while she was sing, singing the song. And then she even, what was even more peculiar is that she leaned in. And so she was really trying to get the point across to me. She started to lean in and sing even more intently towards me. So she was sort of saying, you must get this message. 
You must understand what I'm trying to say to you. Um, I felt a little bit uh, taken back that I was being singled out in the dream. I felt like, oh, I'm being singled out here. And what even was interesting was that the other people that were in the room took a step back as though they were saying, this is a private conversation. We need to step back a little bit out of the, out of the way because it's not about us. It's about what these two people are communicating here. Um, so whatever that message was, and I, like I said, I don't remember the name of the song. I don't know what it was that she was singing to me. I know it was a jazz song. I know it was a love song. And I don't remember what, it, I don't know what it was. And I knew it was something that I knew. It was a song I was familiar with. So anyway, that's a long story. Um, but then at the end of it, <laughs> this is the funny part of the dream. Um, after she, she got kind of like, okay, now I'm done. I've got the, I gave you the message. Now she says, um, oh, by the way, I used to be an entertainer, <laughs> a bit of an entertainer when I was younger. And she got up and she was like, she did a little happy dance. She did a little a tap dance. For us, it was. I mean, that was the funniest part of the dream. I'm thinking, oh, what was that about? But what happened was, all of us in the room went, whoa! But we, it made us happy. We all began to smile, and we, in the room, I could feel all of us relax. Like, oh, okay, that that moment's over, and and she's doing a little happy dance. And she 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 was like, I guess that's basically what it was. I think she was showing us her joy. So she just did a little 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 jig in front of us. It was very cute. And then the dream ended. And it was after that I woke up. And like I said, I these verses came to mind, of course, immediately, was the exodus of the Hebrew people um, just before they cross over the Red Sea. So we, as we know in the, name, the story of the Ten Commandments, what happened next was the people were so-called entrapped between a rock and a hard place, a rock and the sea, the deep blue sea. And that's when... The Egyptians thought they were going to get their spoils back and kill all the people before they crossed over. But what ended up, ended up being was the army of Egypt ended up being destroyed just before uh, the old Lord mirac miraculously opens the Red Sea and the people cross. So what this exactly means exactly, I'm not exactly sure because I um, God's ways are not my way, but he gave me this dream. Um, it was to indicate, I think, maybe for the America, if it's just, if it's not about the rapture and that we're getting ready to cross over and the Holy Spirit is saying, thank you, you, you did your job. This is where you needed to be. This is exactly what I wanted. Um, it was to say that, you know, if it's uh, just a message for America or the world and cleaning up the swamp, um, it could be that, um, Or I lost my train of thought. Something popped up on my on my screen here. Um, it could be that if it's a message for America, because from what I understand, that um, some, some something huge is getting ready to go down in February. Something massive is getting ready to go down in February, in in America, uh, from all uh, indications that there's something very very big getting ready to go on. And what to me was interesting. Uh, I will, let me just read a couple of verses here from Revelation. Uh, in the book of Revelation, um, when the Lord opens up the sixth seal, uh, Revelation 6, 12, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken of a, a, a mighty wind. So there's a storm and Donald Trump has said something about he is the storm. And this is a, ma a major storm that's getting ready to happen in this passage in the sixth seal. It's, it's talking about trees. It's talking about the fig tree. It's talking about being the storm that is going to shake this tree. Um, and Revelation 6, 14, And the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of its place. 
and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondsman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Um, this all came to my mind in the last couple of days. How, uh, well, it's been there. Like I said, there's news reports that the rich people are are actually bugging out now, that they're hiding in their, the 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 rich men, the queens and kings and monarchs, and because they know that whatever is going to happen, it's going to go down, and they're all going to be exposed. Every last one of them are going to be exposed in the next little while um, for what they've been doing. They're, the wrath of God is coming up, down upon their heads, and so what they're doing, they're bugging out. They're going into the places that they prepared for themselves for this day. Um, I think that they know that something big, other, nu uh, there's going to be a brief sh um, nuclear exchange or something is going to happen or there's going to be a rock that's going to come and hit the earth any day. Who knows? I don't know whether it's this day, this year, whatever. But I do know that we see what this this passage is coming to pass. We see that the, the rich and the mighty people are saying we are going to be exposed. We better bug out while we can. So I think this is what they're doing right now. I think they're preparing for this very thing. Um, also, this is a passage of the rapture because this the 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 uh, heaven shall depart as a scroll as it is rolled together. Uh, that is the, this whole passage actually matches Matthew twenty four, which is actually a rapture passage. It's also the time of the the wrath of God. It's all it's all there. Um, but I also want to give you a little bit of hope here because in Revelation chapter three. The Church of Philadelphia, this is what it says here. Um, uh, let's read the whole passage of Revelation chapter 3. This is the Church of Philadelphia. And to the angel of the Church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet, to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go no more out. And I'll write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of, out of heaven from my God, and I'll write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the, the Spirit saith unto the churches. The rapture is in the book of Revelation. It's in several places in the book of Revelation. I've already shown that over many, many videos. Um, this is where the rapture is. We see the rapture again, the raptured people of God, the Church of Philadelphia, in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. We see the Church of Philadelphia raptured before the great wrath of God falls upon the earth, which is Revelation chapter 8. Um, so I want you to see that, that there is hope for there is going to be an hour trial that's going to come upon the whole world to try them, to dwell upon it. But the Church of Philadelphia will be removed from that hour. The other churches, I'm sorry, they haven't got their wedding garments on. And that is the parable of the wedding supper, and that's Matthew 22. And I'm going to talk about that briefly for a moment here. That if you haven't got your wedding garment on, this is the only way to get into the wedding supper of the Lamb, is to put your wedding garment on. Um... There's a lot of people who think they or say they are Christians, and I don't doubt, doubt that they follow Christ, uh, but they still haven't put on their wedding garment. There's only one way to put on your wedding garment, to be ready for the wedding. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter in the kingdom of God. There's Matthew 22, 1. This is the parable of the wedding feast. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. They would not come. This is the parable about Jesus Christ and his wedding supper in heaven. And again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them, 
which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my, and my fatling are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their way, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servant, and entreated, and, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But the king heard thereof, and he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burnt up their cities. And he saith unto his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which are bidden are not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, as many as you can find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together as many as would be found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with, uh, with guests. I want you to see this, both bad and good. Now how is it that bad people can get into the wedding supper of the Lamb? I'm going to tell you this in a second. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there was a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now why is it? We don't know whether this man was bad or good. But he wasn't allowed into the wedding supper because he didn't have a wedding garment on. But how is it that both the bad and the good were allowed into this wedding supper? Now this is something that people don't talk about. The, uh, uh, you, this is one thing that's always disturbed me about the gospel, I mean, the Grace Church, the Grace Church, and they don't even hear themselves say it. Uh, we all get we are when we confess Christ as our Savior, then we're saved, and we, that's it. That's all you need to do. You don't need to do anything else. And yet, yet when you say to someone, "Oh, so and so," I don't know whether they're a Christian. They don't act like a Christian. So basically, what they're saying is. You're saved by grace, by not by works, lest any man should boast. So you don't have to do anything to be saved. And yet when you ask them, they say, well, you have to lead a good life. Well, hold on just a second. You just said you don't have to do anything to be considered a, a child of God. All you have to do is confess Christ and that's it. And you're saved. So, but now they turn around and they say, well, you have to lead a good life to prove that you've been saved. Basically, what they're saying is, you have to have works in order to prove that you're saved. That's what they just said. I, I hear it over and over and over and over again. People, they don't even hear themselves say it. Okay, now that you've confessed Christ, now you got to prove that you're actually, you know, and you know that you're actually worthy to be saved by leading a good life. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be leading a good life. That's not what I'm saying. But when you're when you don't realize, a lot of people are saying this. They're not hearing themselves speaking because although they say you're saved by grace and not by works, lest any man should boast, that's their favorite verse, and they cling to it like it's like it's the only verse in the Bible. They are not hearing themselves say, well, now I've got to have works to prove. or uh, That person over there, I don't know whether they're saved or not because they haven't done the works to prove that they are actually saved. So they're actually quite hypocritical. They're hypocrites in what they're saying about salvation. So they know in their heart something is missing. But in this verse, it says both bad and good are invited to the wedding supper. Now, what does that mean? It means that we are not saved by our works, just like they're saying. We're not saved by our works. And there are going to be some people who will be saved that don't have time to, to, to uh, improve their life or to put on good works. But God still has the grace to save them or the ability to save them, even though they are not perfect people. Now, how is that possible? How is that possible that both bad and good are wedding, invited to this wedding supper? And yet there's one person that was there who had didn't have a wedding garment on. And we don't know whether he was good or bad. What is the difference? Why? What? What did these people, both bad and good, do that made them different from this man that didn't have a wedding garment on? I think that's what I'm trying to get to. The difference that, that this person has made is that they were baptized into Christ Jesus. They put on Christ. When you put on Christ, according to the book of Romans, Romans 8, I believe it is. Let me just see if I can find it. Romans 8. Now there is therefore no condemnation, no condemnation, whether you're good or bad, there is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Remember in my dream, the Holy Spirit was the one who was leading us. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. So, um, for the law could, uh, let me see, oh, that's not where I wanted to go. But this is basically, what, um, let, me, let me finish this passage because it's very interesting. It pretty much says what I want to say, but I think it's not the passage I'm looking for. For what the law could not do, in other words, being a good person and following all the rules, the law couldn't set you free from the law of death. Uh, for the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sent his own son in likeness of sinful flesh. So Jesus put on sin for us and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded, minded is death but to the spirit but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Um, so basically, we put on Christ when we are... Uh, let's go to Romans 8, 11. But, it, but if the spirit of him that raised Christ up from the dead dwell in, dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall, be, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. So therefore, when we are clothed in Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection... We have the same inheritance. We are quickened by the Spirit, by His works. Not our works, but by His works. Now, let's, let's find out how to put that, put Christ on. What does it say in Romans? It's, I think it's Romans 6. Romans 6, two chapters before. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live, live any longer therein? Know you not that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead from the glory, by the glory of the Father, even so are we also, we should also walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we shall not serve sin. For he has freed, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. So when we are baptized, we are not baptized, um, uh, let's put it this another way. When we are baptized into Christ Jesus, we put on Christ. So as when we are raised into newness of life, we are dead to our sins. We have now put on a new garment. We have put on Jesus Christ. We have put on his finished work, not our work, not our deeds, not our goodness, is what's getting us into heaven. Oh, I've confessed Christ. Now I've got to live a good life so I get make sure I get into heaven, which is what this grace church tells you. Okay, I've, I've confessed Christ. Now I've got to, oh, I've got to try and pray. Pray every day. Pray, 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 pray. And I've got to do it oh, so that I make sure I can get into heaven. So what they're saying is I confessed Christ, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to save me because now I have to work to get into heaven. That's what they're selling you. And this is what Christ tells these, the churches of, of the book of Revelation. Six churches are judged by their works because they hadn't put on the wedding garment that would get them into the wedding feast. They're still carnal Christians, as I said in Romans 8. Romans 8 talks about these carnal Christians, fleshly Christians. But we are not fleshly Christians because we put on Jesus Christ. Now we are now spiritual Christians. And that one thing, that one act of obedience that Christ tells us to do, uh, commands us to do, puts us into a different category of salvation. It puts us on, in the wedding supper. It puts the wedding garment on us. Not because we're good. Not because we've done en enough things, enough Hail Marys, or or pray, 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 uh, that you, you're, you're found worthy and all that kind of stuff that you have to do. All you have to do is put on Christ. And when you w w arise in newness of life, the Holy Spirit inside of you, which is indwelled in you, will now help you to walk a new life. But you are already saved. You have been now 
been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You are now in the wedding supper and you've got the wedding garment on. Um, let me just prove this to you for those who don't believe this. Uh, let's go to the book of Acts. Acts 2, 38. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. Um, this is the uh, sermons, the sermon of Peter, his very first solo sermon of um, after Jesus Christ had uh, ascended into heaven. And this is what he tells the, the people who hear the gospel through the, the words and the mouth of Peter, um, the very first sermon. Uh, uh, Acts 2.37 And when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sin, for the washing away of your sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Two different separate acts going on here. Three, actually three. Repentance, um, being baptized in water, and then uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Three different things. You are, there are three, there are three things that do, you, not because you're so good are you saved, but because you believe the word and you do what Christ tells you to do. So in this, uh, this is what they said. And for the promise, for the promises unto you and your children. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, la, 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 la. For the promises unto you and to your children, for all those that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. Many are called and few are chosen. Um, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and that same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Let's go to the book of Luke. End of the chapter. Uh, end of the book, book in Jesus Christ's own instruction to the people. Before he ascended. Oh, it was not. This is not Luke. Hold on. Hold on. I got the wrong part. Well, it was not Luke. Is it John? Mark. No, it's Mark. Mark 16. One of the last things he says to the people. The Great Commission. Go into Mark 16, 15. And he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Oh, Jesus said that? Oh, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So this is not a conditional salvation. It's not, okay, if you confess me and if you lead a good life uh, and if you have time to do some good works, then you'll be saved. And if you pray, 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 and if you, you fast and you do this and this and this and this, and if you follow the Ten Commandments, blah, 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 then you might get saved. No, this is an unconditional promise to these people. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It's an unconditional promise. And he that believeth not shall be judged or damned. It's what it says here, but judged. So basically, you should be judged by your works. Uh, just like he says in the, uh, the book of Revelation to the six churches that are left behind, that are not removed from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, they shall be judged. They will, and that's what Christ tells them. They are judged by the works. Read every last one of those uh, churches, and you will find there is only one church that is not judged for their works, judged by their works, and that is the Church of Philadelphia. That's the only church of those seven churches in the book of Revelation, Revelations 2 and 3, that are not judged by their work. They're all judged by their works except for the church of Philadelphia. Why? It's not because they're better, both good and bad are getting into heaven because they've got their wedding garments on. Why? Because baptism is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. That is your wedding garment. Also, the book of John, this is my last passage I'm going to go to, John 3, this is after the baptism of Christ. And I want you to remember if those who, who know the story and those who don't know the story. When Jesus was baptized by John in the River Jordan, and there was no reason for him to be baptized because he was sinless. His baptism was a new thing. It was uh, God um, showing us how to be born again. When Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, and he came up immediately out of the water. A dove came down upon him, which was the... The dove signified the Holy Spirit indwelling. The Holy Spirit didn't indwell Jesus Christ.
before his baptism. And the voice in heaven said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus at that moment was born again. He came down and lived in the human flesh to be part of us, but he had to be born again. And he had to be the firstborn among many brethren. And that's how he did it. And he was showing us through his baptism how to be born again through baptism. When he rose up from the, from the, from the water, the dove came down, which was showing us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, this, this passage in John 3 is Jesus Christ talking to Nicodemus and he was telling him you must be born again. And this and everyone knew what he was talking about in those days. But since then this passage has been muddled and fuddled and um, twisted so that people couldn't get the true message of what they're saying. It's saying all they were saying is all you have to do is confess Christ. This is not what this passage is saying. This is about how to be born again and why you must be baptized. That's what Jesus is talking about to Nicodemus here in this passage. This is my last verses to go through. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. And he came to Jesus by night and he said unto him, Rabbi, we know you are the teacher from God, for no man can do the miracles thou those, those does, except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He, what is he talking about here? He is talking about the rapture of the church that is in the church of Philadelphia, that our tribulation that shall come upon hold the whole world and the, rap, the church of Philadelphia is removed from that hour of trial. This is what this is talking about. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born and when he is old? He, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Good question, Nicodemus. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit. Where did we see this very passage, this very pattern, water and of the Spirit? At the baptism of Christ Jesus. When Jesus was baptized into the water, he came up out of the water and the Holy Spirit descended on him. This is what this is talking about. That's how you're born again. There is no doubt about it. So if you have not heard this message, you better take this seriously and get it done quickly because we don't have much time. Let me just finish this little bit and I'm done. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Where did we see that before? Oh yeah, Romans 8. Romans 8. You cannot be born again unless you are born of the spirit, which is water baptism and then the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Repentance, water baptism, and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Not because of your works, not because you're so good, but because of his works, his finished act, his, his doing, what he did, his death, burial, and his resurrection, and conquering death, and putting death to death, are we then clothed in Christ through water baptism. You put on your wedding garment, and I'm going to prove that this is your wedding garment. I'm going to prove that this is your wedding garment. Marvel not that I said you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it lists, and thou hearest the sound thereof, and canst tell from whence it comes, and whither it goes. Even so is that which is born of the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit. Nicodemus said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? How can you not know this? You guys had a whole, you've been living for thousands of years with the understanding of mikvah, a baptism, although you didn't have the full truth of it. And now you don't understand what I'm saying to you? How can you not understand this? This is simple. This is child stuff. This is stuff you should have known at your mother's knee. Um, okay, now I want to go down here uh, to the same, this famous passage, which is, of course, in the same, dis, dis, um, same sermon by Christ to Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only born son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but him, but that the world through him might be saved. So what did I say about the other passage in the book of uh, Mark, Mark 16? You shall be saved when you put on Christ. This is what this whole passage is about. Putting on your wedding garment. Let's go further in the same chapter. 
John the Baptist, John 3, 22. And after these things, Jesus and his disciples in the land of Judea, and there he, uh, uh, excuse me, after these things, Jesus came and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. This was not the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, because the indwelling of the Holy Spirit for believers had not occurred yet. It did not incur, occur until the day of Pentecost. So this was a physical act that these people were engaged in. Jesus and his disciples were going around baptizing. This was a promise that was made to them that when the day of Pentecost came, that's when the Holy Spirit came down and dwelled those who had already been baptized. And then Peter then told also the other people who were, were, who were gathered at that day on the day of Pentecost and told them, you must repent, baptize, and then you shall receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You see, the, the apostles and the disciples were already prepared for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because they already did the first thing they needed to do. They did the repentance and they did the baptism. Already, it was already done. That's why the Holy Spirit was able to indwell them. We had this story of, Nick, of, the, of um, the Gentiles, but then when, uh, um, when, um, when Peter went to go see the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit came down upon them too. But what was, what, what people always use that as an excuse. You see, the Holy Spirit indwelled them. Yes, but it was a sign. It was a sign to Peter to tell them to not deny the, the, the Gentiles from coming into the church. And immediately Peter commanded them. He didn't say, I suggest they be baptized. No, he didn't suggest it, people. People, He commanded them to be baptized. He commanded them to be baptized. Where's the water, he said. He was screaming, where is the water? Get the water. Where is the baptismal? Let's get them in. No waiting, no, no, no hesitation, no, oh, we'll think about it. Oh, it might be a good idea if you do this. No, it was a command. He was urgent about it. Okay, so it says further, um, and the... And they tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there. Much water was there. And they came and were baptized. And John was not yet cast into prison. And there rose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came to John and said unto them, Rabbi, so baptism was about washing away your sins. But John's baptism was only temporary. It couldn't fulfill and make you born again. It couldn't finish the work because it was only the beginning work. And later on in the book of Acts, when Peter uh, uh, and Paul came across peop, uh, disciples of John and said, were you baptized? They said, yeah, we were baptized in the baptism of John. They said, that's not good enough. You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And they took him to the water and baptized them a second time. Because John's baptism wasn't sufficient. Only Jesus' baptism was sufficient for their complete salvation. It says, um, And they came to John and said unto Rab, Rabbi, uh, He that was with thee beyond Jordan, and whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizes, and all men come to him. So they were saying, Everyone's going to Jesus now and being baptized. He said, uh, um, this is the same, the same guy that you said had the Holy Spirit. You saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him. He's going around baptizing people. Isn't he your disciple? And this is what John says. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given to him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am set before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, I must decrease. So this is basically a testimony about what John was telling his disciples. I am only the friend of the bridegroom. I am not the bridegroom. I am the friend of the bridegroom. Now the bridegroom is now increasing his his, his his bride. He's he's increasing. He is bringing into his, he's building his congregation. He's building his church. You must do what he does, not what I do. If he is now bringing people unto him and they're being baptized in his name, that is what you need to be doing. That's what puts you in the, into the wedding supper of the bridegroom, not the not the friend of the bridegroom, but into the the, the wedding supper of the friend. I'm, I'm excuse me, the wedding supper of the bridegroom.
I'm sure you can see what I'm saying. It's very, very clear. This passage is not that hard to understand. When you understand, this whole entire passage is about water baptism. Jesus did not leave us a clear understanding of why it was important to be baptized. It's all through the scriptures. There are at least 70 plus um, uh, passages in the New Testament about baptism alone. Baptism. In the Old Testament, there are also indications of baptism. Things that, purif uh, acts of purification that Jews had to go through, including mikvah or baptism, getting in and dunking yourself in the water. But in this case, this is being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the book of Revelation, Church of Philadelphia, they are clothed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's written on us. In the Church of Philadelphia, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What do we do when we're baptized? We're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why you are clothed in Christ. And this is not a work. It is, a, if you will, it is an act of obedience for your for your perfect salvation. Perfect salvation. I guess the reason I'm being so passionate about this is because I don't know how much time we have. I don't know whether this next few weeks what what's this going to this this dream that I had about leaving Egypt getting ready to cross the Red Sea is an indication that we're that close to the rapture of the church I don't know whether we're going to be here for another seven years I don't know but there's going to be a lot of Christians who have not got their wedding garments on and are, who've been invited to the wedding feast but have not put on their wedding garment and they're going to be shocked as all get up when they are left behind because they did not do what God told them to do, what Christ commanded them to do, what Peter commanded them to do, what Peter, uh, but Paul commanded them to do, what John commanded them to do. The, it's all through the scripture. And yet, if you don't have the eyes to see, you don't have the ears to hear, you're not going to hear the Holy Spirit tell you what you need to do. Open up your ears, people. Don't listen to traditions. Don't listen to what you owe you. It doesn't feel right. You do what God tells you, whether you, how you feel about it or not. I know I'm going off on tangent here, but I, I just feel, I, I'm feeling that something very urgent is getting ready to go down. And if you're not spiritually prepared for it, you're going to probably regret it for probably the rest of your life. However long your life may be, you're going to regret it, that you did not obey the Lord. This is not my salvation, people. This is not the salvation of such and such a church or so and so person who Christian leader. I'm talking about the salvation of Christ Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the one who died for us, his salvation plan, the salvation plan of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is their way of ensuring that we are not left behind when it all hits the fan. OK, I'm urgent about this. I'm passionate about this because this is God's salvation to you. Unless you are born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He is referring to the rapture. This is a rapture passage. This whole, whole chapter, don't just stop and read John 3.16, which is what they do. That's the only passage they allow you to read here. They ignore practically everything else of what this passage is about. And these Bible teachers know better. They know better. But they don't want you to know because of their traditions. Because the hardness of their own hearts. They don't want you to have this, this promise, whether you are good or whether you are bad, to be invited to the weather, wedding supper by putting on your wedding garment, which is Christ Jesus. Romans 6, Romans 8, the whole book of Romans. That's what this is talking about. Okay. So anyway, I've gone on <coughs> quite a bit now, longer than I expected. I always do. <laughs> I'm sure you're not surprised. I'm sure you'd be shocked. 
that I sometimes go on a little bit long, but this is important. This is really important, especially after this dream that I had that shows us that we're that close. We're that close to something huge going on, whether, like I said, whether we're here another year, another two years, another five years, another 10 years, I don't know. But you are not fully prepared for whatever is going to go on unless you put on your wedding garment. The Church of Philadelphia is promised to be removed from that hour of trial. There's going to be something that's so huge that's going to happen on the earth. Whether it's a nuclear blast or a stone being thrown into the, into the water um, from the heavens. Who knows what it is, but something is going to happen that's going to put the world into such a frenzy. And it's going to be so horrific for the world for a period of time that the world's going to have a hard time recovering from it before the temple uh, the temple in Jerusalem is built. But something is going to happen. Okay? So if you want to be prepared for the wedding, they put your wedding garment on. And that means repentance, being baptized, and then receiving the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Okay? God bless. Have a good day.